thanks very much for uh, Julie for that talk. I think there's some nice uh, crossovers between oh, great. Paris and panel. I think will work. Um, let us start in 1885, which was a landmark year for women's literary culture in Britain. Even despite the recent Coulomb scandal, we see a diversity of female seekers who are accelerating their quest, not simply to uh, encounter, but also to find new narrative forms uh, to describe the esoteric wor world. So alongside the activities of Anna Kingsford, Emma Hard Ritting, Mabel Collins, Mary Ware, aka Una, and soon to be Madame Theon, was touring London's heterodox lecture circuit to promote the teachings of her Universal Philosophic Society, while another pseudonymous <coughs> Mary, Boren Mackay, and also known as Marie Corelli, had started to write the occult romance novel, which when published in 1886, would launch her career as the best-selling British novelist of the 19th century, by far regularly selling hundreds of thousands of titles a year. Now, these two women are never discussed together, and in one respect, it's easy to see why. After her 1885 marriage to Max Leon, Mary Ware left the Britain in which Corelli would make her name. They never met, and Ware, while we know she was a devotee of the arts and an ardent writer herself, performed her literary labours in an obscurity that was worlds away from the dazzling glare of publicity which surrounded Corelli and which she indeed um, cultivated for herself. So what I want to do in my paper today is to suggest that there's important reasons why, despite this seeming misalliance, we should align these figures both to suggest how late Victorian popular fiction might have helped to form a reception context for later esoteric currents, but also to reveal where in Corelli's shared role in formulating models of female seekership and initiation at a time when women's access to institutionalised occult training was still relatively new. Now, one of my figures would take this task up through podium speeches to limited audiences and um, uh, uh, pamphlets, the other under the much broader ages of popular fiction and celebrity culture. But what they're both doing, I would argue, is trying to find ways to reimagine women not simply as spurs to or foils of male initiation, but as adepts in their own right. Feminizing a male tradition of arcane knowledge tra tradition hitherto associated with what ha had been until uh, Corelli's romance, um, the most century's most influential occult novel, namely Edward Bulwer Lytton's Zanoni. I won't talk too much about Zanoni, but I'm hoping many of you will, will know it. Um, and briefly to pick up on, on Julie's discussion there of um, a, a, a brief proceed of the state of woman in the occult revival in this mid 18 period, mid 1880s period, when we know that they were playing a central, but as others have pointed out, decidedly ambiguous role um, in the movement, um, acting as spiritual teachers, campaigners, channels, and healers, while often deferring authority for their powers or their right to know to male adepts, whether they be living or disincarnate. In many ways, then, what we can see within um, the ancient wisdom-affiliated esoteric current is a replication of the pattern of empowerment through passivity that we associate with the much more exoteric popular movement of modern spiritualism, which has been documented by people like Alex Owen and Anne Broward and others. Now, although never wholly separable, their practices and constituencies often overlapped, we can, in part, distinguish spiritualism and occultism in this period by their differential emphasis on knowledge acquisition um, and intuition, where spiritualists often author authorise the results through what I would call a cultural capital of ignorance, that is, messages are uh, validated because of the, uh, there is no way that the speaker could know apart from interference from another force. Um, things are very different in the esoteric context where knowledge is acquired through effort, through study, through purification and initiation. So we have a situation uh, for female occultists who are seeking to identify themselves and indeed other women not as passive channels but as learned addicts who are looking for new paradigms for doing so, for seeing themselves as teachers and transmitters of knowledge that they could hold without wholly jettisoning the spiritual capital allotted to them through more traditional ideas about female spirituality or hyper-receptivity. Popular fiction, which had from Friedrich Schiller's The Ghost Seer to Zanoni, proved so central to the promulgation of the male initiation plot, 
would again be enlisted as an important vehicle in this transformation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit um, about uh, what I'm calling the occult buildings roman, the, the, the novel of occult development. And this is a popular sort of subgenre of British Gothic fiction um, uh, after the years of Zanoni, which had been very successful. We can see it surfacing in novels both by um, just simply enterprising uh, gothicists who are looking for a good commercial plot, but also um, so Bill Worland himself, also in his later novel Screen Story, um, but also confirmed believers, for example, um, Pashal Beverly Randolph's The Wonderful Story of Ravelette from 1863. Now, Zanoni, um, like Ravelette, depicts the transmission of esoteric knowledge as an exclusively male enterprise. Living women, when they appear at all in Bill Worland's novel, are either distractions from or impediments to gnosis. As the century progressed, and women gained more access both to the profession that was authorship and to esoteric study. However, the situation changed, and we start to see what I call the woman's occult building woman appear in greater numbers. Now, this is a very loose and admittedly baggy category, and we can break it down in three ways. Um, this could include fiction written uh, by men, which uh, uh, describes women as adepts or members of secret societies. Uh, H. Rygard Hager's uh, She is probably the most famous of, example of that category. Then fiction about male occult initiation, produced by women writers, such as Emma Harding Britton's Ghostland. And then finally, and rarest of all, fiction about female initiation written by a woman, into which category we can put Mabel Collins's The Blossom and the Fruit from 1888, and also Corelli's tremendously successful A Romance of Two Worlds. Now, what all these different kinds of the, the genre that, um, that I'm, I'm theorizing, um, what they share is a generally fairly strong level of pessimism about women's per participation in occult study. Are they dramatizing the dangers to a woman who pursue it or the dangers from pursue it, uh, uh, from those who pursue it? Um, and we can see this in, in novels like Ghostland and, and Blossom and the Fruit here. Um, but not all of the period's female culturalists were sceptical, at least in their fiction, <coughs> about women's ability to help themselves and, most importantly, to help their sisters enter the temple. So, to go a bit more about Mary Weir here. Um, as far as we know, she never wrote a woman's occult buildings roman. We don't have the manuscript of her novel. It would have been amazing to see that. Um, but in her only recently discovered background as a mother superior at Clayton, she had more direct experiences of founding and administering an all-female spiritual commune than almost all of her contemporaries in the Victorian cultic milieu. But where, as we know, never acknowledged this experience when she was lecturing as Una in the mid-80s, but it must undoubtedly have fed into the Universal Philosophic Society's understanding of the gendered dimensions of human spirituality. In this period, as Julie's just been uh, explaining to us, Una was a socialist, a eugenicist, and a separate sphere feminist who quickly soured her initially warm reception within London's spiritualist community by denying that seance room manifestations were spirits of the dead at all. And this is something she shared with Blavatsky. Um, exoteric spiritualists also balked at what they viewed as her overly cautious and even elitist approach to the study of spiritual phenomena. This is Burns writing. Um, medium and daybreak, saying, the logic of Una is such that a man must become highly skilled before he commences his apprenticeship. But it would be absurd to stay proceedings until we had so much knowledge that we could commence in an orderly manner. Interests me here is that Burns's uh, journals are identifying in Una's words an almost Zanoni-esque restriction of esoteric knowledge to an elect few. If you know Zanoni, that novel only has two initiates at most it's simply too dangerous to let anyone else in. So these suspicions, um, voiced here by the medium and daybreak, uh, were to a certain extent vindicated by Una's own, own discouragement of discipleship. Although we know that the Universal Philosophic Society recruited members, although we don't know how many, Una also insisted that she wanted no converts, claiming that in all of her previous eight incarnations, she had been murdered for um, the cause of Pan and the Light King and Eros, and had no wish to condemn her supporters to a similar fate. 
the end of it, for her, the press reported, will probably be a violent death, and therefore she does not wish anyone to stand by her in this. She will have no fellowship in death. Now that said, Una certainly held beliefs which she wished to impart to her listeners, particularly the women who, in their acts of sexual selection, had the ability to shape future generations for spiritual elevation. In her 1884 uh, manifesto, Sayings of, of the Sibyl, Alta Una, she counselled in terms that maybe remind some of us of, of Randolphian sex magic, that being should be bliss. No one has the right to give being to uh, uh, others who cannot, by hereditary and envi environment, ensure the being for which she is responsible. Woman should therefore select one who is in some way the highest within her reach, and at the same time best suited for the requirements within her being. Now, where this option failed, she argued the state should step in, doing all in its power to encourage the union of the highest and to discourage the union of the lowest types of humanity. Now, as we've been hearing from Julie, this encouragement of woman's sexual choice did not extend to a similarly radical challenge to their traditional domestic roles. Um, you talked about um, uh, her lecture on women's rights. I won't um, quote that again, but yes, uh, uh, the, the argument here that a um, uh, woman's role is to live contemplatively at home so she can help her partner to rest and show him how to concentrate his exertion. These sentiments are also repeated in the sayings of Sybil, again where she laments and uh, attacks the so-called rivalry between men and women and argues that women should be taught that their chief glory and right is to be the rest giver of him whom they have chosen so that, so that to him home of which they are the goddess, should be the holy of holies, where in restful contemplation he may attain the new heights of wisdom, love and power. So woman's role here is to facilitate male learning rather to, to, than to attain it for her own uh, 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 purposes. Right. Um, Una's writing in this period then is rough, thus riven with tensions and conflicting impulses both to emancipate and domesticate women by putting their initiatory efforts at the service of male beneficiaries. Um, in the rest of my paper now, I want to explore how those tensions to um, uh, give women knowledge and both make them vehicles for others' knowledge are resolved or attempted to be re resolved in a contemporary woman's occultural text, namely Marie Corelli's A Romance of Two Worlds. Has anyone read this? <laughs> oh yes, of course. Of course. Uh, I strongly recommend you do if you haven't. It's it's a, a absolute sensation. It made her uh, brought from uh, obscurity into mass fame in the mid eighteen eighteen eighties, and by the end of the century, um, uh, you know, Corelli was shifting hundreds of thousands of titles a year. So that was an incredible reputation that is now um, almost entirely forgotten. So what is the connection between these two? Well, I don't want to suggest that there was a relationship of direct or explicit influence between them, although I have to say there were times in my research where I was really tempted to make that argument. Um, we might consider, for example, Una's vanguard esotericization of electricity, one that precedes Corelli's own spiritual treatment of that energy force by two years. So in object eight of Una's 1884 objects, axioms and laws of the universe, oh, there's some really cool. She took a lot of uh, fascinating self-publicity photos, this is one of them here. Um, uh, but in the axioms and laws of the Universal Philosophic Society, Una had wrote that electricity and magnetism are the duplex envelopment of psychic force, which is life, and that by its means, physical <coughs> life may, apart from violence, be indefinitely prolonged. The planets of our solar system brought into general communication, unknown power and attributes latent and man developed. All of this, she says, we can do through electricity. Well, this could very easily be taken as a prospective pressy for um, Corelli's A Romance of Two Worlds, which famously promoted what she called an electric creed. Um, and this defined God as being pure electric radiance and counseled that humans could, by cultivating our spiritual electricity, attract mates and repulse the wrong kind of partners, preserve our health, beauty and life, and also communal spiritual entities. The novel's protagonist and the narrator is an unnamed female musician who's suffering from a nervous depression. 
She's introduced to the Electric Creed in Paris by a mysterious Chaldean mage called Casimir Heliobus and also his beautiful sister Zera. And they mentor her as she takes a cosmic voyage through the universe to see all the other planets and eventually to see the electric godhead at the start of the centre. This is a very unlikely plot for a Victorian best-selling novel, but nonetheless, here we go. Um, at the end of the novel, um, uh, the protagonist concludes, as for the electric origin of the universe, a time is coming when scientific men will acknowledge it to be the only theory of creation worthy of acceptance. All the wonders of the universe are the result of light and heat alone, which must go on producing, observing and reproducing worlds, suns and systems forever. Now, in light of sentiments such as these, um, and also <coughs> of the deployment of this cosmic voice trope, which is so common to Victorian Swedenborgian writing, it will be no surprise at all that this book was hailed by uh, occult believers as one of their own, as an occult text. <coughs> and also, secular readers routinely misinterpreted it as a theosophical novel. So, for example, in an 1870 review article on recent occult fiction in Lucifer, um, the novel is hailed alongside um, Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as proof of, quote, the rapid evolution and change of public thought in the direction of the mystical. The American spiritualist and new thought pioneer W.J. Caldwell in his 1890 studies in theosophy also devotes a whole chapter to Corelli's Electric Creek, arguing for the viability of its central claim that electricity is a spiritual force. So one can find Corelli appearing repeatedly later in works of occult philosophy where she is written about as if she is an exponent of these beliefs. The same thing happens in the mainstream non-occult place generally uh, if you know Corelli, she had um, a terrible reputation in the literary <coughs> press, which was soundly condemned um, uh, for um, her, her plots, for her prose style, also for her popularity. But even those who disliked her um, also believed that she was necessarily moved by some sort of esoteric affiliation. So deriding the plot of a romance of two worlds as grotesquely impossible, William Wallace wondered in the romance whether it might be a sort of sub rosa theosophical novel written, quote, for the benefit of the modern faithful, like Mr. Sinnott's Karma. While in 1888, the Tory Quarter the Review accused the novel of having lifted its male characters from the writings and persona of M. Josephine Pelladin and Loris Oliphant. And that review really interests me, first of all, that a writer for the, this Tory uh, review in 1889 would know who these figures were enough to find in, to recognise them in Corelli. Now, publicly, and perhaps also privately, these interpretations infuriated Corelli, who routinely and almost definitely disingenuously denied any, any borrowing from or awareness of es esoteric thought at all, insisting that her novel was driven only by, quote, the well-worn doctrines of Christ that had fallen increasingly out of fashion in these heterodox times. In her introduction to the 1887 new edition, reprinted in all subsequent versions, she complained that people of all shades of opinion who had, uh, she complained about them who had written to her asking her for more occult secrets. Their disappointment is always extreme when they learn that my creed has its foundation in Christ alone, she writes. Ooh, yeah. um, it's were I to initiate them, or rather to pretend to initiate them into some new or old form of Buddhism, could I show them some trickery such as vanishing a box in the air, the turning of a red flower to white or white to red, or any of the optical illusions practiced with such skill by ordinary conjurers, I might easily be surrounded by disciples of occultism, persons who are generally ready, nay, even eager to be deceived. Now here Corelli, like Una in her lectures, and with similar ambivalence, disavows the project of proselytization, even while herself cultivating a following by presenting herself as an inspired genius figure. This pose as a sanitized occult roman romancer who had no dangerous allegiance to Eastern thought proved highly successful over the next several decades. I think it also makes her an important unrecognized participant in the hermetic reaction. We need to think more about how popular fiction has been involved in those currents <coughs> at the time. In the occult novels which followed, she would also pioneer a model of female wisdom acquisition in many ways much more radically woman-focused 
um, than the similarly gendered scripts emanating from the esoteric movements which she routinely pilfered from, and I'm sure she did. So um, I'm going to talk in this, this part of the lecture about how the novel maps female initiation. Um, it's a non-animalist protagonist who I'm going to refer to because she doesn't have a name, so I'm going to give her one. I'll call her the electric woman. Is initiated into the electric creed sewer process that is partly textual and also partly entheogenic. Her first teacher and healer is the artist Raffaele Cicilline, who she meets while on holiday in the Riviera. He has learned the secrets of esoteric pharmacology and gives her some, quote, fragrant golden coloured liquid and a manuscript entitled Letters of a Dead Musician, which prompts her recovery and also gives her a vision that will ultimately take her to Paris, where she'll study with Heliobus. And these two early encounters are, I think, are really important because what they do in her meeting with um, um, Heliobus and with Cellini is they set up and then they deny the expectation that her recovery will come through heterosexual erotic union. She ultimately takes neither men of these, of these men as romantic partner. Instead, Heliobus <laughs> provides her with written instructions and entheogenic stimulants, some which she takes in the form of bast tonic. I've never come across this in any, anything else from this period. In the form of? Bast tonic, bubble bath. Oh. So cocaine bubble baths that makes you see the ghosts. <laughs> I would love some. Um, <laughs> but so maybe that's Torelli's own, I don't know. So she does this. Uh, and this allows her to become initiated, but also qualifies her to teach, should she find willing subjects. So what do we think so far about this plotting of her attainment of wisdom? Well, it might seem to reproduce the patriarchal model of knowledge dissemination that I argued earlier is pervasive in popular Victorian, other popular Victorian initiatic novels. After all, her entrance into the temple is brokered by an all-knowing and presumably ancient male magician and seemingly staked on her own figurative unsexing. So Heliobus is, is the first in a long line of um, Eastern misogynist figures that um, uh, uh, Corelli writes about who teach women but also have a disdain for women. And he tells the protagonist that her spiritual interests are really only about a vain desire to restore her look. She rebukes him for this angrily, saying, um, you do not read me aright if you judge me as a mere woman who is perfectly contented with the petty commonplaces of ordinary living. I tell you, though in your opinion, it is evident my sex is against me. I would rather die than sink into the miserable non-entity of such lives as are lived by the majority of women. And I would say that the fact that Heliobus takes her on after this outburst doesn't mean that he's changed his mind about women. I mean, he continues to refer to women in this novel as nothing but lumps of lymph and fatty matter. Um, but rather that he believes she actually is no longer a woman. In some way, she has transcended her gender, just as she will leave behind her body to go on this trip through the universe. So that's one initial response to the novel, but I don't think it's one that holds up. Underlying the novel's masculinist initiatory drive is a countervailing emphasis on the female identity of the universe as disembodied addicts and on the initiatory power of erotic love between women. Cellini and Heliobus are the electric woman's first teachers, but they're not her last ones, and I would say they're also not her most significant ones. On her cosmic joy, uh, voyage, her, go her guide is an entity named Azul, identified by Heliobus as being both his twin flame and the source of spiritual force. Now initially, and for halfway, uh, half of the novel, we don't know what gender this spirit has, as a spirit is gendered at all. It's only when the astral flight is underway that Corelli ventures an identifying pronoun. When the spirit asks, the protagonist asks Azul why Christ should have been martyred for such undeserving creatures as human beings, Corelli writes that the spirit turns her eyes with a look of surprise. So now we know this is a woman showing another woman this God. But it doesn't stop with a woman revealing the universe uh, to another woman, but um, in fact with, with, with uh, an act of um, deification. Right? Talk about this now. Coming over halfway through the narrative, this late stage revelation undermines the masculine spiritual hierarchy hitherto in place and prepares her for an even greater deviation. So in order to answer the question that the narrator had about why would Christ be sacrificed for someone as lowly as humans, 
Azil gives her a starring role in a vivid visionary recreation of the book of Genesis. So here we, the speaker finds herself suddenly in this beautiful circular garden <coughs> within which a whispered voice enjoins her to create. And then, by the mere desire of my being expressed in the waves of electric warmth that floated downward from me to the earth I possessed, my garden was suddenly filled with men, women and children, each of whom held a small portion of myself in them, inasmuch as it was I who made them move and talk and occupy themselves in all manner of amusements. Now let's stop for a minute and think about what's actually happening here. I think this is unprecedented in the canon of Victorian occult fiction. I've certainly never read an incident like this before. A living woman, via the agency of another disincarnate woman, becomes God. Right? A status she retains later in the vision when in a bid to rescue mankind from its impending annihilation, she comes to earth in the form of Christ or in the electrical parlance of the novel God's Cable. In this startling thought experiment, the romance goes well beyond recognising women as potential possessors of wisdom to installing them as a prime mover behind a universal religion. Um, okay. So Karai's feminisation of esoteric secretship in the novel, a process that we might refer to as something like femi-esotericism, isn't just restricted to a visionary context, it also takes place on Earth. In the novel's mundane settings, it is continued by the figure who dominates the second half of the novel and who fulfills the previously deflected romance trajectory, Heliobus' sister, Zera. Now, we know that she has been uh, Heliobus' only female initiate until he meets the electric woman. Um, and he tells the electric woman that Zera um, uh, is essentially passive. Uh, she can use the creed for her own protection, but she cannot teach it to others. But the novel calls this, this into question. Certainly, Zera does indeed have power of self-defense. The novel tells us that um, at 38, she looks much younger uh, than she is and thus continues to attract the sexual attention which the novel suggests would never otherwise accrue to a woman of that age. <laughs> when harangued for her hand by the unsuitable Prince Ivan, she rebuffs him with an electric charge. Right? What a great tool to electrocute. Um, people who are hitting on you. Um, but as she can repulse, so too, so too can she attract via electricity. And her target in this novel is none other than the electric woman herself. Indeed, the two spend all their time together. Zero dresses her, reads with her, and directs her to keep silent when talking to friends about her treatment. Zero also devises for the electric woman um, the trope, this is very traditional trope in these kind of novels, which is the trope of the initiatic trial, right? From the addict to the novice. And if you've read Glinda, uh, as a noni, you know about this. Uh, this is where in, uh, uh, Glinden is the, um, uh, the novice in Zanoni. Um, and in this trope, you're told there's something you must not do, right? And then it's a test to see whether you obey or not. Well, it, I'm sure it's okay. Um, uh, Zin, uh, Glendon and Zanoni does not fulfill this, uh, but Zera does. Um, uh, Zera tells um, the electric woman not to go into her studio. Okay. Uh, and she succeeds it. Uh, she, she, she takes the advice. Um, Zero tells her, you have none of that vulgar curiosity which some women give way to when what they desire to see is hidden from them. You are not inquisitive, are you? And then the protagonist laughs and replies, Bluebeard's chamber would never have been unlocked had I been that worthy man's wife. Notice the effects of that comparison. Who is being compared to Bluebeard and Bluebeard's wife? This is now being transposed onto a relationship between two women. And like Glyndon, the electric woman passes her test and its completion contributes in no small part to her final acquisition of wisdom. So Corelli's intertextual allusion to the glyndon Maisonure trial in this incident seems to me deliberate and overt, working to position the electric woman's relationship to Zera, no less than to her brother, as an initiatic one. Now, if I am right in this interpretation, then a romance of two worlds immediately gains distinction as perhaps the only Victorian occult novel in which a woman successfully initiates another woman. If anyone here knows of any other ones, do let me know. Um, uh, with uh, the reference to Bleed, Bluebeard, as I mentioned, also positions this relationship between the two women as a spousal and a romantic one, 
a suggestion intensified throughout the novel in the electric woman's clearly erotic response to Zera. When they first meet, she marvels, never shall I behold again any face or form more beautiful. Her figure was exquisitely rounded and proportioned. As her intimacy deepens, the electric woman's narration struggles to contain these feelings within platonic boundaries. My beautiful tender Zera, how innocently happy she seemed to be thus embraced and how gentle her lips met mine in that sisterly caress, we might begin to be unconvinced by the repetition of sisterly. This erotic intensity reaches a peak after the electric woman returns from her voyage across the universe, and what she does is immediately go to Zera's bedchamber, where she can watch her sleeping without interruption. How beautiful she looked, almost as lovely as any of the radiant spirits I had met in my aerial journey. Her rich dark hair was scattered loosely on the white pillows, her lips tenderly red, like the colour on budding apple blossoms in early spring were slightly parted, showing the glimmer of the small white teeth within, and her nightdress was slightly undone and half displayed and half disguised her neck and daintily rounded bosom. I don't think I'm reading too much into that. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's clear what is going on there, and it's part of... Corelli's canny marketing to her audience, but also a sexualization of this relationship. Now, inspired to action, the electric woman tries to kiss the sleeping beauty, only to be held back by an unseen force similar to the one that had earlier repulsed Prince Ivan. But their share of repulsion. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to right. stop. Oh, right. uh, <laughs> it's well, late. I will, uh, let me say what, um, why I think this matters. Um, uh, I want to juxtapose this to, um, to uh, and Una's more niche universal writings on gender group stenosis to de demonstrate the range and complexity of competing models of female seekership at this period, which is, I would think, a high watermark for women's occult participation. I don't think that we can look at esoteric philosophy and popular function in isolation. I think they're too mutually involved. Um, uh, I think that <coughs> Corelli perhaps pioneers a brand of female culture that is maybe even more radical in its abandonment of traditional constructions of female spiritual essence and more queer in its account of initiation than anything we find in, in its sibylline sayings of the same period. And I suppose really in conclusion, what this does is, is open up new questions about what it is that popular culture, popular fiction can do that maybe even the, the, the more restricted writings can note and how these perform a reception context toward each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.